Hey guys, welcome to Head and Spinal Injuries. Uh, this is a little different than face and neck injuries. Uh, those are really soft tissue and bone type injuries. Uh, this chapter is going to deal with more of the brain, the spinal cord, and the nervous system trauma that people can experience. Uh, fair warning, this lecture is fairly long. You'll, you'll get it in at least two parts, uh, if not three as we go through it. There's some really difficult concepts that you're just going to have to commit yourself to understanding. So our goal with this lecture is to understand the fundamental knowledge and provide a basic and some advanced life support for our head and spinal cord injuries. Uh, we want to make sure we recognize our life threats, recognize spinal trauma, and uh, discuss the pathophysiology assessment and management of penetrating neck trauma, laryngotracheal injuries, uh, spinal trauma, facial fractures, skull fractures, foreign bodies in the eyes, dental trauma, and laryngotracheal injuries. Uh, nervous system trauma is, is where we're going to focus the majority of our lecture on. This is where the majority of your national registry test will, will test you on, and that deals with injuries to the, to the brain and to the spinal cord. So what we're going to start with is we're going to start with the pathophysiology uh, or the anatomy and physiology. Then we're going to move into the different injuries and how they affect the brain and spinal cord and kind of what you can do about them. The nervous system is a complex network of nerve cells that enables the body to function. Uh, it's consisted of the brain, the spinal cord, and the peripheral nervous system. The brain and spinal cord are the only parts of the central nervous system and then uh, the peripheral nervous system is what uh, feels and then commands your muscles to move so that's your sensory and your motor neurons uh, head trauma is um, defined as injuries to either the head or the brain Okay, so a scalp laceration would be considered head trauma, but not necessarily a traumatic brain injury. A head injury is a traumatic injury to the head that may result in injury to the scalp, head, or skull. Uh, a traumatic brain injury is brain is an injury to the brain itself. And we see a lot of these in our soldiers coming back, but traumatic brain injury is one of the number one causes of death from trauma and then spinal cord injury is um that's where you end up with your paralysis and it's usually permanent so the nervous system is divided into two different sections there's the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system the central nervous system consists of your brain and spinal cord and your peripheral nervous system consists of all the other nerves in your body okay um, the peripheral nervous system controls voluntary and some involuntary activities. The somatic nervous system does involuntary and the autonomic section of that peripheral nervous system does involuntary. And your central nervous system, for the most part, is completely involuntary. It functions on its own. Peripheral nervous system has the somatic or the voluntary and then it also has the autonomic or involuntary uh, nerves that command it so the scalp the scalp is the skin covering to the skull um, it contains a lot of blood vessels and a lot of capillaries so if you injure your scalp you're going to bleed a lot and then your your the, the skull consist of your cranium and your facial bones and uh, we talked about these in the last chapter you have your mandible your maxilla your zygoma your nasal bone and then you have your cranium which in so the brain connects to the spinal cord through the the large opening we call that the foramen magnum um, the foramen magnum is the the very very top of the spinal cord and it kind of plugs in the brain almost like you plug a plug into a light socket um, there are four major bones that make up the cranium. The occipitate is the bony prominence in the back of the skull. The, the temples or the temporal regions are those bones right in front of the ears um, that kind of stretch out and go to, to your frontal bone, to your forehead. And um, the parietal regions, those are the bones right on top of the skull. The face is composed of 14 bones. 
Uh, the maxilla, that's your upper lip bone. We talked about that in the last chapter. And that's the non-movable bone. The mandible is the lower jaw bone. That's the movable bone. And the cheekbones are called zygomas or zygomatic bones. Uh, the eye socket uh, is made up of the frontal bone and, the, cr and the, the cranium and two facial bones. We call that region the orbits. And um, your nose is, is mainly just flexible cartilage. The There's no bones that make up the, the part of your nose that protrudes from your face. Then you get to the spinal cord. Um, this is really important to note, especially when you start getting into your advanced semesters. But the uh, spinal cord is broken down into your cervical, thoracic, lumbar, sacrum, and coccyx. Okay, there are seven cervical vertebrae, twelve thoracic vertebrae, five lumbar, five sacral, and four coccyx. Okay, your coccyx vertebrae are um they're fused together, but um. I've always remembered 712-554, sacral thoracic lumbar, cervical thoracic lumbar sacral coccyx, 712-554. Um, you will be asked questions on the, the different areas and the different parts of the spinal cord. And you may be asked, you know, like down to what, how many vertebrae are contained in the thoracic section of the spinal cord. So the spine consists of 33 irregular bones that are called vertebrae. They articulate or meet together to form the vertebral column and the spinal cord runs down the middle of it. We'll, we'll see a picture of that in a minute, I'm sure. The vertebral body is made up of bone that provides support and stability to the spine and to the whole body. Um, it also provides protection for the spinal cord. Um, what you have here, this is the body of the spinal column where your vertebrae are. That's that real strong bony part. Your spinal cord is held right in the center of that, okay, and is protected by these spinous processes and transverse processes. And um, what happens is the nerves protrude from that spinal cord through those bones out into your body. That's why if you get a slipped disc, um, it pinches the nerve and causes pain. So the intervertebral discs separate and cushion each area of the vertebrae. That's, that's this right here, that blue part. That's just the cushion between the bones. It keeps them from rubbing together, touching each other. Um, you ever heard of a bulging disc? A lot of times is um, when this blue part is kind of slid over to the side and it starts bulging out. And your nerves come out here. So if that disc starts bulging out, it's going to put pressure on those nerves. Um, these allow the the spinal cord to move and flex and um you know we see a lot of peripheral nerve injury as the nerves are, are leaving the the spinal cord here or right right here we see the the pinching and that injury which causes substantial back pain so the central nervous system consists of the brain and the spinal cord okay the brain is what gives you your functioning ability it also makes you who you are. It controls metabolic processes. Um, it is a very perfusion sensitive organ, which means any change in blood pressure, blood volume, oxygen content, any of that stuff will disproportionately or affect the brain uh, greater than it, it normally you know, would affect any other part of the body. A couple of key points to point out here. Your cerebrum is this big part of the brain here okay that makes you who you are that's your fine motor your thought foresight and judgment um vision hearing all of that takes place in the cerebrum the cerebellum that's where you get your gross motor movement um and then you have your brain stem over here and that's where you get your basic functions. The medulla controls your heart rate. Located within the medulla is the pons, and the pons is your respiratory center. It controls the rate and rhythm and depth of your respirations. So your frontal lobe, right behind your forehead, okay, that's what makes you who you are. 
thought, foresight, planning. Um, if you've ever seen the movie uh, White House Down, the uh, CIA director who orchestrated the whole scheme had a frontal lobe tumor, which means his decision making was compromised. Um, right here, that's your smell area. Um, this would be like your temple area. So you have speech. Your ear would be located here. Hearing right off of that ear canal. And then you have your primary motor area, primary sensory area. This is where you actually begin to interpret um, the senses that you have. Your occipital lobe way back in the back, that's vision. Okay. So you have your frontal lobe, temporal lobe with your ear right in the middle of that vision in the back movement in the front okay sensory kind of in the back so that's how your brains broke up the very frontal lobe makes you who you are thought foresight planning right behind that is your motor area kind of in the middle in the middle a little bit further back is your sensory area vision is your occipital hearing right behind the ear and the temporal lobe smell is right in the very bottom of your frontal lobe the limbic system just allows for fluid to flow through your brain the cerebellum coordinates your body movements the cerebellum is that small leaf looking structure <clears throat> up under the cerebrum um, the brain stem controls your functions of life this is where your medulla is uh, this is where your pawns are controls heart rate blood pressure breathing and um, that all comes from your brain stem that's why you could be virtually brain dead and still be breathing with a pulse as long as your brain stem is intact um, and then the spinal cord its job is to transmit nerve impulses uh, between the brain and the rest of the body so what happens when you stub your toe is your toe sends a signal to the brain that said that hurt and then your brain sends a signal to your foot to jerk that toe back away from that stimulus. So the meninges, uh, these become very important when you're isolating brain bleeds. And um, when you start talking about meningitis, that's an infection of the meninges. Uh, meninges, you will need to know their order from the skull to the brain because you will be responsible for, I'm not going to say diagnosing, but recognizing um, subdural, subarachnoid, um, and epidural hematomas um, in some of your, your testing, and we'll talk about those later. But um, there's three layers. The dura mater is this blue layer here, okay? A epidural bleed would be between the skull and the dura. A subdural bleed would be between the arachnoid mater and the dura, which would be right there. And then a subarachnoid bleed would be between the arachnoid and the pia mater, um, which is this little area right, right below that arachnoid space. Um, an intracranial bleed would be below the pia mater. The peripheral nervous system has 31 pairs of spinal nerves and 12 pairs of cranial nerves. And uh, the cranial nerves are things like sight, smell, hearing, and then your 12 um, or your 31 spinal nerves exit from the vertebrae. Okay, there's a couple of um, areas that you really need to be aware of. Um, C1 and 2, right here at the very top, that's going to control all functions of life. A fracture of C1 or 2 will almost always result in instantaneous death. C3, 4, and 5 keep you alive. Okay. Um, they control your diaphragm, okay? C5 through T1 controls your upper extremities, okay? So if you have paralysis in your upper extremities, that's going to be somewhere between C5 and T1. So it would be C5, 6, 7, or T1, okay? L4 is part of the lumbar plexus, L1 through 4. Okay, and L1 through 4 um, controls the abdomen, the genitalia, those kind of things. And then the sacrum is the buttocks of the peritoneal region and the lower extremities.
Now it's important to point out that if you have a fracture and a, a severed spinal cord up here at say T1, you're going to lose feeling and movement in most cases completely below that point. Okay, so you're going to lose all that. You're going to be able to turn your head, maybe move your neck, but you're going to lose everything below that. The somatic nervous system, this is your um, voluntary nervous system. This is your muscle movement, your muscle contraction, relaxation. Um, your autonomic, think of autonomic like automatic. The autonomic nervous system <clears throat> controls the function of your body's vital organs. Um, and it does this through the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems. If you are not familiar with parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system, make sure you go back to your patho chapter and really review those. The cranial nerves pass through openings in the skull and transmit sensation directly to and from the brain. The cranial nerves are the only nerves that do not go through the spinal cord. The peripheral nerves go through the spinal cord and the spinal cord is just a big like power line. It's um, just a big pathway for these signals to go up and down from the peripheral parts of your body. Um, this is a good example. Um, you get your hand too close to the flame, sends a message up here to your spinal cord, which sends a message to your brain that says, hey man, move your hand. So sensory says, ooh, that's hot. Brain processes it and says, move your hand. The autonomic nervous system or the automatic nervous system. Um, it um, has sensory and motor nerves that often overshadow the role of the spinal cord. Okay. Uh, the sympathetic nervous system is controlled by the hypothalamus. The parasympathetic nervous system um, is re responsible for conserving energy and maintaining normal organ function. So uh, the sympathetic nervous system, that's your fight or flight. That's your epinephrine or your adrenaline. Your parasympathetic nervous system is mediated by acetylcholine. And that's your feed and breed. So um, sympathetic nervous system lets more light in so you can see your enemy. Increases respiration and dilates bronchioles to have more oxygen. Causes vasoconstriction to shunt blood to vital organs like your brain so you can think. And um, it also causes you to become nauseous and maybe vomit. And that's because of the contraction of the blood vessels in the GI system. The parasympathetic nervous system this is what makes you hungry. This is what allows you to rest and sleep. Um, this is what motivates your sexual drive. So um, this is your parasympathetic is your body at rest. Your sympathetic is your body in its fight or flight stage. Um, head injuries uh, is a traumatic insult to the head that may result in injury to soft tissue, bony structures, or the brain. Um, just a simple way to put it, a head injury is an injury to any part of your head. Closed head injuries, this is usually from blunt, blunt trauma. Uh, we see our skull fractures, our focal brain injuries, where you have like one part of the brain that's, that's hurt or swelling. And um, depending on the, the amount of energy or force, you can also have your diffuse brain injuries. And we see these a lot of times with shaken baby syndrome, diffuse axonal injuries, um, things like that are swelling that you know, causes midline shift that gets really bad uh, bleeding inside that cranium. Those particular things are closed head injury. Open head injury, this would be like a dive that penetrates the skull or a gunshot wound. And what happens is the dura mater or even your, your brain contents uh, will begin to, to protrude and leak out of the hole in your skull. Um, open head injuries almost always leave some kind of neurological deficit. Because once the brain pokes out of that hole, it's, you, know, you really can't just poke it back in and it still work. Uh, not to mention the issues you have with swelling and infection. Scalp injuries. Uh, we talked about these in facial trauma. Lots of blood vessels. Um, scalp injuries we need to pay attention to for, for two reasons. Number one, what caused the scalp injury? How bad is it? And could there be an underlying injury to the brain or to the skull? Uh, number two... Scalp injuries bleed quite a bit. So in some of these patients with severe scalp injuries, we can actually you know, have a patient in shock from um, <clears throat> external bleeding from a scalp laceration uh, 
um, or something like that, just depending on how much blood they're losing from that drain. So skull fractures, they may be open or closed. A couple things, this is a periorbital ecchymosis or raccoon eyes. That's indicative of a skull fracture. And this is battle signs, um, ecchymosis or bruising behind the ear. Um, they, they call that a submastoid ecchymosis, I think is uh, a term that they use for that. But those are indicative of skull fractures. Skull fractures can be open or closed. Um, lots of closed skull fractures, you know, face plant on the, the windshield. Open skull fracture is when you can see the skull or the brain, however deep the injury is, when you can see down in there, that's considered open. Closed is where you cannot see the skull. So linear skull fractures are non-displaced skull fractures, and a lot of times they follow the lines of where the bones meet. They follow those fixed cranial joint bones. But um, a, a linear fracture, uh, the, the skull bone is not displaced. Um, and I kind of think of it as like a hairline fracture where the bones aren't displaced, but there is a fracture down the middle of that bone. Depressed skull fracture, I think of getting hit in the head with a hammer. One area of the skull is just depressed in, and a lot of times you'll feel some crepitus there. Depressed skull fractures push that bony prominence, that, that fracture bone, right down on top of the brain and can um, cause serious, serious brain injuries. Basilar skull fractures we see with high energy trauma and open skull fractures are where brain tissue or skull is exposed to the environment. Um, so here's an example. Um, basilar skull fractures, these are typically bottom of the skull. Um, these can stretch around and get into your orbits or even down into your sinus. So basilar, think base, base of the skull. Um, and you'll see CSF um, coming from the ear nose or eyes a linear skull fracture that's just a line no displaced bones depressed skull fracture really looks like they got hit with a hammer that skull is depressed down onto the brain and then your open skull fractures you can see right here or you can see part of the brain hanging out so that's just the different types of skull fractures our job is not to fix the primary injury there is nothing we can do for primary injuries. The brain injury that has happened is going to stay. Our job is to mitigate these secondary injuries. Okay. The most important thing that you're going to do is to prevent hypoxia. Even one small period of hypoxia leads to way worse outcomes. The second thing you're going to do is to take care of hypoxia and hypotension, okay? So we took care of hypoxia in step one. Step two, we're gonna maintain an adequate blood pressure. Make sure we're treating these patients for shock and you really want your blood pressure around 100 systolic with your head injury patients. And we'll, we'll talk about why that is in just a few minutes, but um, there's some formulas that we talk about to figure out if we're getting the enough blood to the brain to perfuse it. Um, the third thing we worry about is infection. Okay, we want to make sure we cover any open wounds. And then there's not a lot that we can do about intracranial hemorrhage, cerebral edema, increased intracranial pressure. Those things, or cerebral ischemia, um, those things are taken care of by a surgeon. So the best way to treat these things is to rapidly get them to a hospital where there is a trauma surgeon there ready to take care of them because this, the primary, the primary brain injury, we cannot affect. We affect those, the secondary brain injuries. Our job is to prevent or limit secondary brain injury. So the brain can be injured directly by a penetrating object as a result of an external force exerted on the skull. Um, this is your coup contra coup where the frontal lobe hits and then the occipital lobe hits, the brain bounces back and forth, back and forth. When this happens, the brain begins to swell, okay? And uh, the brain is in a fixed vault. And um, what we say about the fixed vault is, is there's brain tissue, cerebral spinal fluid, and there's blood in this vault. 
if any one of those three gets bigger, you're going to have pressure on the on the brain. So as the brain swells, it puts more pressure on the brain. And so if I have pressure here and I start swelling, that pressure is going to branch out until there's increased pressure all over the brain. And it's a vicious cycle. Um, it's swelling, hypoxia, tissue ischemia, tissue death, more swelling. And that circle just keeps going around and around until eventually your entire brain dies. Um, as the brain swells, um, you can have vasodilation. And vasodilation can increase the amount of pressure in the cranial vault because it increases blood volume. Vasodilation also decreases um, cerebral perfusion because it decreases the mean arterial pressure of the blood vessels surrounding the brain. So you have more pressure on the outside and then less pressure inside the blood vessels. So blood is actually prevented from circulating inside of that cranial vault. An increase in cerebral edema will cause more swelling. Low oxygen levels, and if we remember from patho, carbon dioxide causes vasodilation. Vasodilation increases intracranial pressure while also decreasing mean arterial pressure so you're not getting adequate perfusion to the brain. Um, appearance of clear pink water coming from the ear, nose, or orbits. Do your target test, see if that's CSF. If it is, you have a basilar skull fracture. And then you have Cushion's triad. And Cushion's triad is just a way to recognize increased intracranial pressure or herniation. This is where the brain, um, for the EMT level, we really talk about the foramen magnum, but there's a couple of other places inside of the skull your brain can herniate as well. But you get irregular respirations with an increased blood pressure. Okay, those are the first two steps in the Cushing's triad. The blood pressure goes up because your body is trying to perfuse the brain. Your respirations become irregular because of the pressure that is being put on the pons over in the medulla. And then the last piece of Cushing's triad is a decrease in heart rate. This occurs because you are now putting pressure on the vagus nerve. Okay, so the heart rate slows down, the blood pressure goes up, and the respirations become slow or irregular or erratic. This is Cushing's triad. When you see this patient with the increased blood pressure, decreased heart rate, irregular respirations, that is from increased intracranial pressure. Um, so increased intracranial pressure is an increase in pressure within the cranial vault around the brain. Um, bleeding, hydrocephalus where fluid backs up, um, those can cause, or brain swelling, all cause increased intracranial pressure or ICP. ICP stands for intracranial pressure. Normal intracranial pressure should um, be somewhere between zero and 10. We do not want to have a lot of pressure inside of our skull. So cerebral perfusion pressure is the pressure in the arteries around the brain that blood flow through. So when ICP equals CPP, blood flow stops, okay? So ICP is the external force that is pushing on the arteries and the brain, but in this scenario, it's pushing on the arteries. Once the outside pressure becomes equal to the inside pressure of those arteries in the circle of Willis, blood flow stops, brain tissue dies. <clears throat> so the body tries to auto-regulate, okay? So when, when cerebral perfusion pressure decreases from vasoconstriction, the body tries to increase mean arterial pressure. Now, you need a mean arterial pressure of, I believe it's 65. Mean arterial pressure on the low end um, should be 60 to 65 on the really, really low end. 
Um, if your patient has increased intracranial pressure, you want a map or a mean arterial pressure of at least 70. And, and the way you calculate MAP is it's diastolic times 2, okay, <clears throat> plus systolic, and then we divide that by 3. So you do your diastolic times 2 plus your systolic blood pressure and divide that by 3, and that will give you your mean arterial pressure, okay? Um, if the mean arterial pressure drops because of vasodilation. So when the body responds to a decrease in cerebral perfusion pressure, it increases mean arterial pressure and actually causes cerebral vasodilation, which in may increase cerebral blood flow, but it also increases intracranial pressure requiring a higher cerebral perfusion pressure to perfuse the brain. If this is not treated promptly, it's gonna die. So monitor signs for, for signs and symptoms of increasing intracranial pressure. Um, one of the late signs that we see is posturing. The corticate is towards the, the center or towards the cord. The cerebate is where the patient kind of pushes away or folds their arm in an outward manner. So. This is the corticate posturing. This is the cerebate posturing. If you see that, that means that you have brain herniation, which means basically the brain is being pushed out of the foramen magnum. Um, focal brain injury is specific and observable. Okay, so you'd be able to see it. So here's your fracture line right here. You would actually be able to see that. Okay, um, a cerebral contusion is brain tissue that is bruised and damaged in a specific area. And then an epidural hematoma is a collection of blood between the dura mater and the skull. A subdural hematoma is a collection of blood between the dura, which you can see in that picture. Dura is that little blue line, and that bleeding is right up under that dura. It's between the dura and the, the arachnoid mater, okay? Um, Subdural hematomas are classified as acute, subacute, or chronic. Um, we see this a lot of times in fall victims. Um, they'll develop a, a subdural hematoma and won't know it for a couple days. And then you have like alcoholics who have chronic subdural hematomas that doesn't cause them a lot of deficit, but there is blood in that subdural space. Um, intracerebral hematoma, this is bleeding in the brain itself. We see a lot of this with strokes and um, those kind of things, uh, but it can happen because of trauma. And then a subarachnoid hemorrhage is bleeding that is right below that arach arachnoid space, so it would be between the arachnoid and the pia mater. Uh, we see these a lot of times with alcoholics and um, older people who fall. Um, subarachnoid and subdural bleeds are typically slow. Your epidural bleed um, is very fast. It's from the middle meningeal artery and it's usually from a blow right to the temporal lobe. And what will happen is the patient will get knocked out from the blow. And then they'll, they'll regain consciousness or a period of lucidity. And then they'll be out again. And they're bleeding really fast because it's an arterial bleed within the skull. And the, the higher the blood pressure goes, the faster that bleed goes. Um, diffuse brain injuries are injuries to the entire brain. Uh, shaken baby syndrome, explosions. We see this a lot in our soldiers. But um, it's a cerebral concussion. A blow to the head or face <clears throat> may cause a cerebral concussion if the brain is jarred around. Um, <clears throat> concussions show no evidence on a CT scan. Um, that is considered a mild traumatic brain injury. A concussion, you're just a little confused, a little loopy, may be unresponsive for just a few minutes. Those symptoms will fade away. Okay. Um, Concussion is rapid onset, short-lived. It resolves on its own. Um, there are some neuropathic changes with concussions, but they're not severe. Um, you make confusion, disorientation. Uh, retrograde amnesia is where you keep asking the same questions over and over and over again. And uh, you'll see this with a lot of times with concussions. They'll ask what happened, what happened, what happened. And then um, ask about symptoms of concussion in any patient who has sustained a head injury. So when you're talking to them, 
you want to pay attention. Are they oriented? Do they have slurred speech? Um, you know, do they remember what happened? Those kind of things can help you figure out if it's a concussion. Diffuse axonal injury, this is bad. Um, this is deadly. We see this with shaken baby syndrome and severe whiplash coup contra coup injuries. This is where the brain actually slides back and forth of the skull and the bottom section of the brain scrapes across the cribriform plate, just tearing it apart. Um, and, and mainly we see this with shaken baby syndrome, but it is possible with any whiplash or coup contra coup injury. Um, diffuse axonal injury is classified as mild, moderate, or severe. I have never seen any mild or moderate. These have always been severe, and most of the time they result in brain death where the patient is taken off the ventilator in three or four days. So spine can be injured in a variety of ways. Compression injuries result from a fall. That pressure will fracture the vertebrae and they'll just kind of collapse down on themselves. Uh, motor vehicle crashes cause all kinds of spinal cord injuries. Um, anything from a slip disc and pinched nerve to fracture vertebrae to complete paralysis. Um, flexion injuries result from forward movement of the head, typically from rapid deceleration or direct blow to the occipital. So if somebody hits you in the back of the head with a bat or you're driving 60 and hit a tree that sudden stop, that's called a flexion injury. Rotation injuries result from high acceleration forces. We see these a lot of times when cars spin out, they'll touch their head. Um, vertebral compression, small fracture of the disc, causes the vertebrae to shrink down and begins to compress the spinal cord. Um, we see these when people jump out of windows and land on their feet. Um, also, we see it if the patient has in the C-spine area, if um, they put the crown of their helmet or the crown of their head down to hit somebody in football, we'll see those compression injuries. So a direct downward force on top of the head or a direct upward force from landing on your feet can really cause those um, compression injuries. And then the disc herniates and these nerves that come out of the disc, you know, over here in the back and on the side, they get pinched and that's what causes you pain and problems. Hyperextension injuries, we see this a lot of times with um, hangings, attempted suicides. Uh, what happens is, you know, right here, this is uh, C1 and C2. Um, a fracture of C2 is actually called a hangman's fracture. And what happens is you disconnect the spinal cord, um, pull the vertebrae apart, disconnect the spinal cord, uh, body loses all communication, heart and breathing stops. So, Spinal cord injuries are determined by dermatomes. We can find out the, uh, the level of the injury by dermatomes. C6 is your neck, your shoulders, and um, it actually kind of does the um, you know, fronts of your arms a little bit. Um, or the, it's kind of splotchy between C6, C7, and T1 as far as arms are concerned. But C6, you're going to be paralyzed from the neck down. Um, L1, that's your belly button, and your belly button would put you um, paralyzed from the waist down, okay? T6 is your nipple line. That would basically put you paralyzed from your armpits down. Um, C-spine, you're going to be a quadriplegic. Uh, T-spine and below, you're going to be a paraplegic. Primary spinal cord injury occurs at the moment of impact. Not a lot we can do about that. Uh, problem is the spinal cord swells, so that injury a lot of times will be one or two vertebrae higher in presentation than the actual injury. And once that swelling goes down, the patient will begin, begin to regain some function sometimes in the extremities above that injury. Um, if the swelling doesn't go down or the spinal cord is hypoperfused for so long, um, it will actually hurt, harm, and maybe even stop any impulse from the inflamed area, not just the actual injury area, but the inflamed area as well. Um, spinal cord concussion. Uh, they call this a stinger in football. This is where you get speared in the back, and your spinal cord, you know, for five minutes, ten minutes, two days, um, will lose function, but the function will spontaneously uh, regain itself. There's no real injury to the spinal cord. It's just stunned for a little bit. And um, a contusion is caused by a fracture, dislocation, or direct trauma, and that's bruising of the spinal cord. Same concept. You may have some deficits for a couple days, but they resolve themselves. Our job is
is to prevent secondary spinal cord injury. A big thing with spinal cord injuries is it causes high space shock or neurogenic shock, and these patients will need uh, fluid volume replacement, if not vasopressin or vasopressors to maintain an adequate blood pressure because we want to make sure that we're perfusing the brain and the spinal cord so as we don't cause any deeper or more damaging injuries to the patient. Uh, spinal shock occurs immediately after spinal trauma. Sensory function below the level of the in injury will be impaired. Um, also, your voluntary motor function may be impaired. And um, you may have neurologic shock, that's vasodilation because you lost your sympathetic tone and your brain can't send a message to your kidneys to secrete epinephrine to raise the blood pressure. So when these patients get IV fluid boluses, they get vasopressors, C-spine management. Just don't make the problem any worse. Um, classic case of neurogenic shock is hypotension with bradycardia. And your blood pressure is low and your heart rate is low because there can be no catecholamine stimulation due to um, the brain can't communicate with the kidneys because the power line's been cut. So we're going to take a quick break here. Um, we'll pick up with the rest of the slideshow after our quick break.